<clears throat> okay, so oh, got it. So I'll start the meditation now, Derek. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, let me. So very nice to uh, see everyone, and uh, we'll just start with some. Uh, let me just. Okay, so uh, please, um, everyone, make sure you find a really nice and comfortable posture. So just kind of wiggle around a bit and uh, make any adjustments you need to make just to let your bodies be uh, deeply relaxed and deeply at ease. And at the same time, um, just let the spine be somewhat um, upright. And so with our practice, we're looking for this combination and, and gradually deepening this combination of real deep uh, relaxation and ease along with a deepening um, alertness and clarity. So in the very beginning, we just begin with the uh, physical posture and uh, you know, let the physical posture support these uh, two qualities of uh, deep uh, tranquility and uh, deep clarity that strengthen in the mind as the meditation progresses. And as we begin the practice also, it can be helpful just to set some kind of clear intention for this next half an hour or so together. Uh, maybe, um, you know, deciding that for the next half an hour, we are aiming to re rest in increasingly stable uh, awareness in the present moment, just letting go of any um, of the thoughts or distractions that arise in the mind and Really dedicating this period to other practice and to cultivating and deepening our ability to stay, stay stably present. And so now let's just um, begin with a brief body scan. So just Moving your attention to the top of the head, feeling the hairs in the crown of the head, perhaps, and just letting the head relax. And then feeling sensations in the forehead, just letting the forehead relax. And relaxing the cheeks, the muscles around the eyes, the jaw, the neck, bringing awareness into the shoulders and the shoulder blades, seeing if you can let go of any tension there. If you need to, maybe clenching them for a moment and then just really letting them just relax. And then bringing your attention into the upper arms and letting those sensations relax. The lower arms, letting them relax. And the hands. The hands tend to be quite sensitive. There's many nerve endings in the hands. Just tuning in to the sensations of the hands. As they rest on your knees or on your lap. And just letting them also relax. And now bringing your mindfulness into the chest. Relaxing the chest. And down into the abdomen. 
Really relaxing any muscles in the abdomen, in the diaphragm. Maybe taking a long, slow breath out. And just really letting things relax. And now bringing awareness into the upper legs, into the thighs, and letting go of any holding there. Just letting them rest against whatever they're resting on. And into your knees, into your lower legs. And feeling the feet and letting them relax. And then just allowing yourself to be supported by the ground or the seat beneath you. Relaxing into support, just letting it hold you. And at the same time, just keeping a certain gentle uprightness and clarity in the posture. And just let your awareness soak through the body and just notice any physical sensations that might be there. Just noticing and feeling any pleasant sensations, any joy or bliss. Any unpleasant sensations pain or tightness, and just being aware and just letting them be there, just being a feeling body. And now just let your awareness naturally settle on the sensations of the body breathing. Maybe the feelings of the abdomen or the chest just naturally expanding and contracting with the breath. Or the air moving in and out of the nostrils. For the next few minutes, just let your awareness stay connected with the movement of the breath and the body. And staying with physical sensations in this way helps the mind become quieter.
Just letting your breath find its own natural rhythm. You might notice your body becoming more and more tranquil and more and more at ease. Feeling of deep ease and relaxation gradually spreading through the body. You can enjoy the relaxation, increasing peacefulness of your body. And you can be aware of the joy and the subtle pleasure of relaxation. And being aware of the pleasure of this relaxation. The relaxation becomes deeper and deeper and you become more at ease. So just staying with this relaxation. With that pleasure for a little while. The pleasure of meditation carries you deeper.
And now you can expand your awareness out of the body. Perhaps being aware of any sounds that might be in the room or outside where you are sitting. Being aware of any smells or maybe the temperature of the room. And getting a sense of the space or the volume of the room that you're sitting in. And then from that sense of the space or the volume of the room, you can let your awareness expand outward, expanding up around you, below you, just letting your awareness becoming more and more spacious. You can either just be aware of space, space stretching in all directions while you're sitting here, or have a sense of a spacious awareness. And you can take the sense of openness, of spaciousness, as your object of meditation. Just settling into an open, spacious awareness. And if anything comes into your awareness, just letting it pass through. In the words of a wise friend, clinging to nothing.
in this feeling of spaciousness, of openness. You might also notice a sense of contentment. Tuning in to this feeling of contentment can take you deeper into the present moment, allowing you to let go of the past and the future. What is it like to rest in simply being contented, open, and aware in the present? with a sense of kindness to whatever arises. A good friend who's also a profound practitioner who is currently dying, recently gave us this profound advice. Cling to nothing and always be kind. Just resting in the present, contented, open, 
kind-hearted and clinging to nothing.
So may any peace or love that we've cultivated in our hearts this evening be for the benefit of those uh, whose lives we come into contact with and uh, somehow in some way contribute to peace and love in the world and ultimately be for the benefit of all beings. So I don't like to disturb everyone's peace. It would be very nice just to continue sitting here in silence. But um, anyway, I will share a short uh, Dhamma reflection now with you. So um, when we meditate, uh, what are we doing? Uh, what is this practice of meditation all about? I once heard my teacher, uh, Sayadaw Ujjagara, say that uh, meditation is about sensitivity. Meditation is about intelligence. And meditation is about adjustment. So I just, in at least the first part of what I share below, I'll I'll be drawing heavily from um, Bhante Jagara's talks and reflections. And um, Sadhguru Jagara is a very uh, dear friend and a teacher of both Venerable Chandra and myself. Uh, we have incredibly deep respect for him. And um, he's really been uh, very supportive and encouraging in our, in our practice for a long time. And so this first part is kind of uh, mm, out of gratitude to him uh, for his uh, guidance and uh, kind of Venerable Chandra and I shared friendship with him. Uh, of course, any inaccuracies of mine and I've the links for uh, what I've drawn from will be placed um, beneath the, the talk. Okay. So sensitivity, intelligence, and adjustment. So sensitivity. Uh, sensitivity is to be attentive, to be listening, to be learning about our environment and about ourselves. So sensitivity is the quality that will enable us to be aware of our environment, uh, the quality of being, the quality of presence that brings us in touch with ourselves, with the world, with the senses, and with the mind, uh, the sensitivity of being intimate, of being close to experience, the experiences of what we see, what we hear, taste, touch, feel, uh, the unpleasant or pleasant quality of our experience and our perceptions. And also being aware of the uh, reactions that sometimes arise in response to these sense impressions. To be able to be sensitive and aware of the wide spectrum of experiences that are happening to us. We need to be balanced. So we could define sensitivity as a quality of presence that is balanced. Now we come to intelligence. Uh, when we are sensitive to, when we are attentive to something over time, then our minds uh, start to naturally form understandings and gain greater clarity of what we're attentive to. So we start to notice more and more details and overall patterns. 
and what we're observing, and we start to see cause and effect relationships. So intelligence and wisdom are not only intellectual, but there is the intelligence of intuition, the intelligence of the arts, uh, the intelligence related to direct knowledge. So just the fact of steady observation allows for understanding to develop. So observation brings us greater understanding of a situation. And if we have a problem, then we need to develop our intelligence to find the solution. That means we need to observe very closely. Uh, and by doing that, we see more and more clearly what is happening, the causes and conditions, the overall dynamics of what we encounter. And when we observe something for a long time, then uh, a response will arise in relation to what we observe. So this is the factor of adjustment. So intelligence is related to wisdom and to knowledge. And uh, we come to know things through our faculty of intelligence. But intelligence without action is useless. And also action without intelligence is useless. So now we've developed our intelligence. What about action and story? So action relates to the situation now. And action relates to the quality of effort, the energy, which may be subtle, that gives us the ability to adapt, to adjust, to balance, and to see how we can respond to our experience wisely so that it can be a source of knowledge, a source of growth, a source of learning, and also a source of development. So these three words, uh, sensitivity, intelligence, and adjustment, uh, define what meditation is. So the practice of meditation requires from us a great de de deal of sensitivity and intelligence. Uh, we need to be very aware of what's going on in a situation and what it requires. So for example, if we were to go outside, wanted to go outside for a walk, uh, we need to consider the temperature. Um, is it cold? Is it warm? Is it raining? And according to our observation of the conditions, we adjust to the situation. So meditation is the same thing. We need to be very aware of our internal temperature. Uh, we need to be sensitive to what is going on in our body, in our mind. We have to observe. We have to listen. What is happening? And this observation brings us understanding. So we can feel in our body, we can feel in our heart, the quality of the mind. And we can see what is needed in the moment and can adjust the uh, meditation practice and response. So is the mind agitated? Then we need to calm down. Is the mind calm, drowsy? Then we need to rouse up the inspiration, the enthusiasm, the energy. So we need to understand uh, what causes the current situation that we find our bodies and mind in. Um, do we eat too much for lunch? Or do we need a rest? Or whatever. So what can we do about it? And how can we relate to the situation? So these three qualities, sensitivity, intelligence, and adjustment, are also known as the first three enlightenment factors, uh, sati or mindfulness, dhamma vichaya or wisdom, panya, and virya or effort. Uh, so sati, this, this quality of presence or the quality of sensitivity uh, lets us know uh, what we are experiencing. Dhamma vichaya or uh, the investigation of phenomena uh, let's us uh, investigate and come to understand uh, why things are happening. And then Viriya or Viriya um, provides us with uh, the how, how we need to respond to the situation, how much energy or effort or what kind of adjustment is needed in this situation. So we have the what, 
the why and the how. Um, speaking um, more generally or in a different context, these are three factors of enlightenment, sensitivity, uh, intelligence, and adjustment. Or sati, dhamma, vichaya, and wiriya are a parallel to the factors of the Eightfold Path. Some of the factors, the factors of samasati, samaditi, and samavayama, or right mindfulness, right view, and right effort. So there's one um, sutta in the Majjhimenikaya called the Great Forty, which describes how these three factors turn around the other factors of the Eightfold Noble Path and help us progress along the Noble Way. So I'll read out the section from the sutta as it relates to right intention. Uh, therefore, bhikkhus, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong intention is wrong intention, and right intention is right intention. This is one's right view. And what bhikkhus is wrong intention? The intention of sensual desire, the intention of a will, and the intention of cruelty. This is wrong intention. And what bhikkhus is right intention? The intention of renunciation, the intention of non ill will and the intention of non-cruelty. One makes an effort to abandon wrong intention and to enter upon right intention. This is one's right effort. Mindfully, one abandons wrong intention. Mindfully, one enters upon and abides in right intention. This is one's right mindfulness. Thus, these three states run and circle around right intention. That is, right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. So um, we need to have the view. This is intelligence or samaditi. So we need to know uh, right from wrong. Uh, however, you know, mere theoretical understanding is not enough, but we need to do something with our understanding. So this is right effort. We need to put forward effort to develop right intention and to abandon what is wrong intention. And then mindfulness has a kind of monitoring quality and overseeing quality, which observes the whole situation uh, and knows what is going on and adjusts, uh, allows us to adjust if more or less effort is needed. Um, so, for example, if uh, a mind state of ill will arises in our mind, then we need to know that this is unwholesome and make efforts to diminish and abandon it. And we need to be on the lookout for its arising uh, through the monitoring quality of mindfulness. So to prevent ill will from arising in our minds in the first place to the degree that we can and also to know when it's there. And then, of course, if positive qualities arise in our minds, either in our lives or that it develops through the meditation practice, we should do what we can to maintain and further develop these qualities. And in general, when we put forward efforts to do things in life, we need to understand what we're doing. We need to monitor or be sensitive and aware about the overall situation, and to be sensitive and aware about the results of our efforts and to be able to adjust accordingly. So wisdom, effort and mindfulness are all needed for our skillful action in the world as well as in our meditation practice. So these three factors are sensitivity, intelligence and adjustment. All right mindfulness, right view and right effort are circle around the other factors of the path giving us the ability to develop these factors in an effective and an appropriate way. Or well, we could say that each factor of the path is developed out of this particular cluster of right mindfulness, right view, and right effort. Um, the fundamental role that these three, first three enlightenment factors play can also be seen in other contexts. Um, so, um, 
Yes, not sure. Um, so the first three enlightenment factors, uh, when they're in balance, also give rise to the other factors of enlightenment naturally. So with the natural unfolding of the seven enlightenment factors, uh, we begin with sensitivity, uh, with that quality of presence, with observation. So we see what's happening in our minds and in our experience again and again, uh, gathering data as we go along. And then wisdom begins to awaken and understands the nature of what we're experiencing, uh, sees the causes and effects, the principles at work, and the overall process that takes place. Uh, this process of wisdom arises directly from our own observation and can also be nourished, of course, by listening to talks, discourses, or through reading books. So this is a wisdom that we acquire from others, and it feeds into and influences and changes our own views and perceptions. But wisdom in the practice lets us know when our mind is out of balance, when it is in balance, of what that feels like. And we know the clues, if any, of the conditions leading up to either a state of balance or imbalance. Also, we need to bring energy to act on our understandings. Um, it takes energy to shift our passions. And even just on the everyday level of practice, the brain tends to hold on to its old neurotic patterns, to its old habits. So we need to bring energy and determination to shift the patterns of our minds. So um, this factor of virya and Wayama um, means both developing what is wholesome and abandoning what is not wholesome and the energy that we need to uh, bring to our practice and our lives to do this. So it's a subtle and steady energy which manifests as our steady persistence and effort, um, the energy of determination. Um, it shouldn't be the kind of energy that makes us tired, but the type of energy that keeps us engaged with the process and able to make the adjustments that we need to over time. So when we are tired, this can be the energy that keeps us on the path and acting according to our highest aspirations and intentions. Um, so when mindfulness, investigation and energy are there, then bliss can arise, uh, this natural joy in the mind uh, and, and a happiness that arises from within. And this joy energizes the body and the mind and pulls us more deeply into the practice. And uh, because it's very um, pleasant, it's also very motivating. And um, when this bliss settles and eases, then tranquility can emerge. So the mind can start to become very quiet. Um, so, and also this quality we can develop both in our practice as a kind of sequential pattern, but also it's a quality of being that we can develop more and more in our lives. So Brick Hansen says, you know, we become um, internally tranquil, less and less troubled by reactive patterns of emotion, and less and less carried away by the feelings of drivenness, even in the midst of being alive and getting a lot of stuff done in the day. At the heart of it all, as tranquility develops as a trait in you, there's an inner peace, an inner quietness, an inner stillness at the center of daily activity. And in our own practice, I think, as you experience tonight, tranquility is a light, deep restfulness, a deep ease. Um, that really helps us settle and let go uh, into the meditation. And so this tranquility uh, moves into concentration, which ultimately includes the jhanas. And um, from tranquility also develops equanimity, a profound uh, emotional balance and disenchantment from what arises in the stream of consciousness. Um, a non-reactivity to both external events and internal experiences. And so in a maybe more worldly context, if we think about these seven factors of enlightenment, we can think about when we're reading a book and when we're interested in it, then we're naturally kind of drawn in. And from that interest, energy arises. We have the energy to read, we don't fall asleep. 
Uh, maybe we stay up all night wanting to see how the story unfolds. And with that interest comes joy. And with that joy and interest, our body comes down and we can sit and read our book for hours. And from that uh, tranquility comes concentration. So we become completely absorbed in our book that we're reading. And we don't even notice the noise and distraction around us. And also because we're so immersed in our topic of interest, we develop a certain kind of imperturbability, a certain non-reactivity to the conditions around us. Okay, so that's kind of how those factors of enlightenment unfold. And uh, in many ways, the ones that we um, kind of actively engage with and um, fuss with or, or bring up are, are the first three. And then the others um, just naturally arise by themselves. I mean, there's some descriptions that show mindfulness, you know, just really establishing sati, is all that's needed and everything will also kind of naturally arise from that. But um, yeah, also those first three are, are quite fundamental though in terms of the different ways that we can engage and work with our minds. And so it's interesting that those three factors of, um, you know, mindfulness or awareness, um, wisdom and um, adjustment or effort are found in the, uh, seven factors of enlightenment they found in the Eightfold Noble Path and they're also found in say the five spiritual faculties um, so I'm just thinking it's worrier in the, sorry I might be wrong about that so I'm not remembering clearly right now anyway um, so I'd like to finish by exploring the three enlightenment factors from a contemporary perspective. So um, this is drawing heavenly from Rick Hansen's work and I've put the um, references below. So uh, Rick Hansen, um, so um, I wanted to say something first, which is it's just quite interesting, I guess, although in lots of ways it's not surprising that when um, in the early texts we find these kind of three kind of ways to engage the mind. Um, you know, it's also found in modern psychology and contemporary kind of literature. Um, but then in, on the other hand, right, anyone who's going deeply into working with their mind and understanding it, um, who has intelligence and the kind of subtlety that, say, the Buddhist tradition has, then it's natural that we're going to kind of hit on the same realizations, whether it's the Buddha and the contemplatives two and a half thousand years ago, or whether it's modern psychology uh, working with all the various tools now. So I guess it's not surprising, but I always just find it interesting seeing these kinds of parallels. So just to share what Rick has to say about these three factors from a kind of in a different context, from a different angle. Um, he summarizes these three ways of working with the mind. Um, or engaging with the mind as letting be, uh, letting go, and letting in. And uh, he observes that human resources training, personal growth workshops, and the world's contemplative traditions um, offer uh, many different ways to be happy, loving, effective, and wise. But for all the variety in these uh, approaches and methods, they cluster into three major ways to engage your mind. Letting be, letting go and letting in. So the first way um, in his categorization, letting be, actually combines those two factors of observation and understanding or mindfulness and wisdom. Um, so this is similar to say how Satisampajanya, sometimes shortened to Satipanya, is spoken of kind of together by some teachers in the Thai forest tradition. And so um, Letting be is simply being with whatever you're experiencing. So here you feel the feelings, experience the experience, the bitter, as well as the sweet. Uh, you could explore and experience as different aspects, such as the sensations in it, um, as well as the emotions, the thoughts and desires, maybe down to the more vulnerable material like hurt, often found beneath anger. And the process of just being with experience 
um, the experience might change, but you're not deliberately trying to change it. So this is the most profound form of practice, uh, simply being with what is there again and again and again, uh, continuously receptive to the reality of your experience. Okay, and then the second way um, in Rick's categorization to work with the mind is letting go. So this describes um, part of the third enlightenment factor of effort or energy. So here you decrease the negative. So you decrease whatever is painful or harmful by preventing it, reducing it, or ending it. So for example, you could vent feelings to a friend, uh, disengage from desires that hurt you or others, uh, step away from self-critical thoughts, stop bringing home cookies that fuel desires for sugar, or ease tension by relaxing your body. And another method I've seen him mention is, you know, imagine if there's a desire or an impulse that might hurt you or someone else, you can imagine you're holding it like a stone in your hand and just drop it. Okay, and then the third uh, way to engage the mind is letting in. And so this um, way part uh, describes the uh, positive aspect of the factor of effort. Um, so here you can increase the positive. So whatever is uh, enjoyable or beneficial by creating, growing, or preserving it. So you can develop virtues and skills, become more resilient, grateful, and compassionate. Uh, you can breathe more quickly to lift your energy. Uh, remember times with friends that make you feel happy. Have realistic and useful thoughts about a situation at work. Or motivate yourself by imagining how good it will feel to eat healthy foods. So, uh, in other words, uh, getting good at coping, healing, and well-being is a matter of getting good at letting be, letting go, and letting in. And so... Uh, although mindfulness is necessary for all of these and uh, these ways to practice uh, with the mind work together. Um, for example, you could use the third one, increasing the positive, to grow an inner resource such as self-compassion um, in order to be with painful feelings. And also you could imagine that your mind is like a garden. And, you know, you can attend to a garden in three ways. You can observe it, you can pull weeds and plant flowers. So observing is, is fundamental when it's sometimes all we can do. Uh, sometimes something's terrible has happened and, and all we can do is ride out the storm, just stay with the fear or the anger and, and not make anything worse. Try not to make anything worse. And um, as our practice matures, then... Um, increasingly we develop the ability to stay with each moment as it arises and passes and becomes something else but you know this is in all of the practice and um, just being with the mind is not enough but we also need to work with it so the mind is is grounded in the brain which is a physical uh, system and doesn't change for the better on its own so Weeds don't get pulled and flowers don't get planted simply by watching the garden. And a lot of the Eightfold Path in Buddhism um, involves making like right efforts, um, samawayama. So, you know, letting go and letting in um, by, say, releasing unwise speech and replacing it with wise speech, for example. So um, letting be, letting go and letting in form a natural sequence. Um, Maybe, you know, you recognize you've gotten resentful about something. You explore this experience and let it be as it is. And at some point, it feels natural to shift directly into letting go. And you relax your body and help feelings flow and step back from troubles and thoughts. Are then in the space made by what you've cleared away. You can let in what might be beneficial, such as self-compassion. And over time, um, as we develop certain strengths such as steadiness of mind, equanimity and compassion, we're able to let be, let go, and let go even more fully. Okay, so uh, thank you all for listening. And uh, that's my uh, reflection for this evening. Um, 
if anyone has any questions or comments, uh, very welcome. I will ask Janaki to unmute. Uh, Janaki, hello. Hello. Um, um, I have a question now. If samadhi is concentration, mm. um, so when we study something or when we drive, or even when we uh, listen to music or listen to somebody's talk. So at that time too, we concentrate. So that concentration and samadhi, how come that they uh, are, are both the same? So uh, can we call that too as samadhi? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think... Um, if I think about samadhi, like it's certain, if we think about it broadly, right, there's a lot of different contexts we could think about it in. So there's the samadhi, say, of the jhanas or being absorbed in something or a surgeon doing surgery and being immersed in something. I think it's a similar factor in the mind, this, this deep steadiness of mind yes, that okay. develops. Um, yeah, so I know concentration can be a slightly problematic word in terms of the connotations it's developed um, over time. But I think, yeah, whatever we are in, like actually one time um, I remember talking at Shivabhante Jagara about samadhi and things, and he was observing that, um, you know, people who say uh, very good scientists or, or very good musicians you know very accomplished for them when they come to the meditation practice because they've already uh, developed this quality of of samadhi in their lives the meditation for them is just kind of like turning over a page in a book and that that quality is already developed right i mean so samadhi itself or that deep you know concentration that ability is just part of our human um, I don't know, bequeathment and something we can all develop in secular or sacred activities. But of course, um, for it to be liberating, it needs to be part of the Eightfold Path. But That's we can right. see That's people right. with good practice, you know, people who are very good artists or whatever, they certainly have good samadhi, right? So samadhi comes, I think, with calmness. and uh, With calmness, so it is... Um, um, it's uh, an interest, no? Also, like if we're too calm, we fall asleep. <laughs> but it has to have that kind of interest in that energy as well, like interest, energy, engagement, yes. um, stability. Um, if we're not being distracted, we're just completely with something, like all of those kinds of factors. Yeah. And then yes. the mind kind of comes together around an object or around an experience. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, some some steady state of the mind so that it it yeah. will not weigh well. Yes. Yeah, yes. and and there is that energy, right? It's not just calmness, but there's that real energy and that real interest. Like I think a lot of us have probably uh, practiced meditation for some time, and sometimes you know we can folk, uh, be too calm without the energy to balance it, and and then we just get very sleepy, right? Like me this morning because I didn't sleep enough last night. But yeah, for me the um, same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're also same on. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, I hope that does that help. Or is yes. it? Yeah. Yes. My random half sleepy. Um, what is it? Um, reflections arising. So <laughs> of consciousness. Yes. Thank you very much. Welcome. So, Perhaps I will be able to ask a question sure. while we're waiting for other questions to come in. And my question would be, it's the first time I've heard the word sensitivity used in this context. 
Yeah. And I would be really interested to hear more about where that comes from and how you use that in your practice personally. Oh, that's a good question. Actually, it's Bhante Jagra's word, and I was just very interested in, in it. So it's not, it doesn't come from me. And I think he was just trying to define it precisely. Um, it's an interesting word. I think it's just interesting to explore. Uh, I think, you know, someone like Bhante Analio will describe mindfulness as more like, you know, a deep receptivity, which is a kind of sensitivity, right? Um, but also that has a monitoring quality. So that kind of overseeing monitoring quality, which in some ways sensitivity may not quite capture, but it also captures that quality of really just being present and really being aware and really tuned into what's happening. So that is a kind of receptiveness. So I just, you know, to some degree, it's kind of interesting just to reflect on these qualities. Um, and some words may not capture everything, but it may capture some things that we're not used to. Um, you know, we might not have considered or we might not have tuned into those qualities enough. So it's just interesting to kind of play with these these concepts and these modes of being. Um, I'm not sure if sensitivity completely captures sati, but I do think it does capture, you know, like if you're very sensitive to your environment, you have to be kind of in tune and deeply receptive to it, right? Or if you're sensitive to someone who's in front of you, there's a real presence, a real being in tune, a real receptivity. And even often, actually, there is an observational quality because being when you're being sensitive to something, you are observing very carefully and uh, letting different modes of information um, come in. <laughs> it's kind of a, you know, open and tune. Yeah, something like that. I don't know if you've got any thoughts or reflections. Just kind of interesting concept, interesting way. So I kind of just like, because, you know, Bhante Jagra, he's quite got quite a keen philosophical mind. And I'm quite interested sometimes at the way he really goes deeply into different factors and uh, kind of describes them. I think that, though, his fundamental, um, I think I might have put this in the notes, but his fundamental description of um, sati is the quality of presence that we bring. So that would be generally his short definition of sati. Yeah. Which is, is in a way sensitivity, but sensitivity kind of just has a slightly different nuance to it. But quality of presence also is, is interesting. Yeah. So. I was going to follow up, but maybe I'll pass over to Samantha. Sure. Hi, Samantha. I, I was also thinking about that word. I was thinking maybe it's like um, your senses are sharp, kind of, you know, in that sense, like you see, you hear. You're really with your experience, right? Yeah. Your senses are like, um, they're not shut down there. Sometimes we, right. we can be somewhere, something happened, we may not even see it or we may not even hear it. So probably, I mean, that's how I try. To it's, no, that's a very nice, that's a very nice extra nuance. I think it's really nice as a group because we all pick up a slightly different association with the word. So yeah, like sensitivity means being aware, being alert, of being aware of what's happening around us as opposed to being kind of tuned out. Is that the kind of what you're kind of touching on there? Mm. Yeah. We're with our experience. We're not asleep. Yeah. Yeah. I will ask David to unmute. It's just a quick comment, really. I'm kind of not an advanced practitioner, but as with the letting be, letting go and letting in, it seems that my life has slowly 
incrementally been changing direction into a direction I never thought I'd head down as a result of Buddhism meditation and the practice. So in some ways it's frustrating because I thought I was going to go in say that direction, but I've kind of ended, ended up going a completely opposite direction to how I thought. It's an it's an odd kind of outcome, I guess, or a yeah, the unexpected outcome. That's very abstract, but you mean just your life's taking you in a different direction than you thought because your interests are shifting and yeah yeah and the more interested in renunciation now and just letting getting rid of as many things as I can and I'd never mm. would have done that just <laughs> keep what I've got but now just if I don't need it get rid of it yeah it's, it's a strange thing there Buddhism <laughs> yeah 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 that's kind it's of it really. so, an interesting journey yeah yeah thanks I'll ask Minora to unmute. It is, um, I, I actually, a bit earlier today, Venerable, I was contemplating on this letting be, letting in, and letting go concept. It needs a very fine balance, and uh, uh, the Sati Sampajanya in during the all of the time kind of that is something that we aspire to develop is it sorry you aspire to do and uh it is you know that the developing the letting be letting in and letting be is um is is related to the sati sampajanya as well isn't it it is it is something that we need to keep on developing um uh not only on the cushion but during our normal life as well isn't it yeah to the degree that we can and and i think it comes over time but also you know i mean all of us even including me and i'm just i'm a monastic i'm much luckier than you in some ways you know we get busy and things but um one thing is just to to find moments to sew it in like you know not to be too hard on ourselves everyone's trying their best but um like I mean you've probably heard of these practices like take certain moments like maybe from the time you step outside your door to when you walk to your car in the morning you take an extra 30 seconds and just slow down or before you start working you just take a few breaths or maybe sometimes when you're eating lunch alone you're really mindful while you eat so part of the secret is just to sprinkle in these moments of, of sati. Um, so, of course, as much as we can all the time, but sometimes, you know, just sprinkling in these moments and, and not beating ourselves up and not being, you know, perfect yogis all the time. I think that can also just, because the little moments add up as well, just like, you know, a minute here, a minute there, this is actually really key to shifting our patterns and shifting our minds. 
and and so just these little moments we shouldn't underestimate and I think it's sometimes you know you don't know how the practice is working until something happens in your life and you're able just to stay with it in ways you might not have been able to before um and and understand it more deeply over a few days and let it unfold even if it's really challenging in a way that before you practice you you weren't able to you know so you know I think there's the it's kind of it grows over time in ways that we don't know if we just stay at it and just keep our interest and just keep on going. Um, yeah, and with the letting be, letting go, letting in as well. I mean, in other places, Rick sort of says, you know, sometimes we can move through it quite quickly. Like, you know, someone says something, it's annoying. We feel annoyed, <laughs> triggered, whatever. And it's not such a big deal. And after half an hour, we can, you know, have a bit of a rant to a friend or or just, just let it go, right? But other times, I mean, something awful happens. Like we lose someone that we love and uh, maybe it's a few years before we're really able to let that go and really start um, letting, letting, letting in again. And so, um, you know, it's kind of a natural process as well. And it's not something we can hurry. It's just something we can be with but of course the more we're actually able to be with our experience and our feelings the more we give them space to move through us but but we can't actually we don't have control right that's one of the lessons of buddhism we can't really control that i mean even me i'm a i've been practicing a long time you know and uh it's just sometimes quite humbling when you're in situations that are quite challenging or difficult and you're like wow been practicing for so long and I'm really activated and I can't sleep and 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 I'm practicing my with staying with my breath and I'm doing that for hours and still not settling like not thinking but still not settling and then you just realize well you know uh I I, I don't know I mean we we try our best and there's definitely a lot of development but we have these human bodies and these human nervous systems and these sensitivities and it's just what it is, right? <laughs> so, I mean, still lose our balance. I think even a long way along the path, it just takes a few sleepless nights and, challenge, you know, strong challenge. And you're like, wow, <laughs> not enlightened yet. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Welcome. I wasn't too sure how to word my follow-up before, so I stayed quiet for a while, but I'd have a go now. Okay. Um, so I was very interested by David's comment about renunciation and also about the use of the word sensitivity. And for me, in my perception, sensitivity means going towards an object or going towards something, being fully involved, which I agree can be a nice way of thinking of presence. But also another aspect of the practice is an aspect of renunciation and also meditation. And I was wondering how you think or how you can advise me how renunciation goes with sensitivity. Um, I think maybe uh, what's coming to mind is, so, so part of the practice is to some degree waking up to our experience. So it does make us more sensitive and that we're more aware of what's happening in our body and our mind and what's around us, right? Rather than being kind of lost in a dream world. Um, but I know what you mean, like, you know, if we um, develop sensitivity about music or about arts or, or whatever it's quite a lot of engagement there so I think this is more um, you know like in our daily life when we're being mindful being just really aware of impacts which is a sensitivity but maybe not in the way it's normally used um, and then in renunciation I guess that then it's 
Well, kind of like the meditation tonight to some degree. Um, and maybe you've also heard Ajahn Brahm's practice. I'm sure you will listen to his. You know, he starts with um, being very uh, like sensitive to and in tune with the body, right? And then he lets it go. And then he lets it go and he goes into being very sensitive to and in tune to the quality of the mind and uh, letting go what's there. But there is this real sensitivity and connection with experience. But he's moving from, um, say, the grosser realms of experience, which is what we are engaged with in our daily life. You know, we're not in jhana. We're not engaged so much with, with the mind. I mean, we are, but we are engaged with the physical world and contact in our, in our daily life. And then, then when we sit, we, in a way, we ground ourselves in that. So grounding ourselves, for example, in the physical sensation is a really good way to get out of the thinking mind. But then we let that go. So uh, once I heard uh, a few times meditation being described as um, or the development, you know, being described as a movement from the gross to the subtle. And so I think that's, yeah, um, being sensitive to the gross, but then once you're really sensitive and connected to it, then you shift to something that's more subtle in your experience and become sensitive to that. And even the practice of metta, right? Or, or, or you know, being sensitive to the a feeling of inner tranquility that arises, that's quite a subtle perception or, or sensitive to that joy that comes with, with mindfulness and steady awareness. That's quite a subtle perception. And it takes a lot of, I think, sensitivity to, to be connected and to be aware of that. So I wonder if that's part of uh, the renunciation process is, is just being sensitive and connected to uh, increasingly subtle perceptions. Yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's, That's, really helpful. Helpful. That's really helpful. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And thank you very much also for all of this thought provoking and interesting and wide ranging talk that you've offered us tonight. You're and very welcome. My pleasure for being with us again so early in the morning, even despite not sleeping so well. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. I think actually not sleeping so well has kind of got me into my train of consciousness mode. You might be getting better answers than when I'm actually awake. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for inviting me. And um, it's been lovely to be with you all again. So sorry for all your great work. Yeah. And for yours too. And I've just put into the chat box the website for your project in New Zealand which is anybody who's listening, bikuni-sangha.org.nz. And if you go to this website, you'll find out more about Venerable Adimuti's project in New Zealand and also the option to donate, which is on the website. If you would like to continue to support the Anukampa project, then we are asking at the moment if you would mind looking at the Amazon wish list where we have the information of things that are needed still for the monastery which has just been set up. I know that Kelly has again been there this week painting and setting up ready for Venerable Chanda's return. So to continue with this if you're able to and you'd like to support with offering furniture or other things which are needed for the monastery then please have a look at the wish list. The link is again in the chat. And finally, there are still spaces available for the events coming up in November with Ajahn Brahm and also for Venerable Chanda's New Year's retreat, which is going to be online, sponsored by or run by Sheffield Insight. All of these events you can find on our website, anucamperproject.org forward slash events. So if you're available in the UK in November or online other times, then please have a look at our website and have a look at the events. So last thing, thank you very much, Venerable, for being here with us again and look forward to seeing you again in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Derek. See you. <laughs>